So see when you get captured, what happens then? I got taken, it was this one day, I never left the apartment on my own because I knew I wasn't supposed to. But we didn't have electricity because it was still sort of war, in, even in Kosovo. So I thought there was always a stand just outside of the window and I could see it from Peter's bedroom. And I thought, you know what, if I could just go and, and just get a magazine so I can read, because I was going a little bit crazy. You know, you, you, you're you there on your own all day. They at work. They can't take you with you. Although they did a lot with me. They took me that I met majority of their f friends in, in the military and stuff. They introduced me. I was not somebody they kept hidden. So the, all their... Um, hierarchy they knew I was there and they wanted me safe and the reason they wanted me safe because uh, again I had cross borders from Serbia to Kosovo so I was a huge target and they wanted me to be safe until they were ready to send me back to Serbia and so um, I thought Do you know what I'm gonna go buy a magazine I had some spare change and I said you know what if I just buy a magazine it's only 50 pence I mean I can read something all the housework were done and I didn't have anything on me. I even left the door uh, semi-open because I didn't intend to take the keys and leave completely. It was open and I just left something to block the door. I went out and I just heard this squeaking wheels like a really harsh black van pulls in front of me on top of the pavement. And I, my my instant reaction was to say, excuse me, watch out. What are you doing on payment? So I'm about to tell them off. Little did I know they're going to actually, they're going to be the ones telling me off and, and completely terrorize my innocent mind. So they they came out so quickly. They opened the doors. And I was like, like whoa, I, I didn't even know what happened. It was so fast. They put this black thing over my head and they both of them, Two guys, they grab me just up here and sort of shove me into the van, close the door, and it's like, let's go, let's go. All in Albanian, they're speaking Albanian. I'm like, this is surely a like a, a nightmare throw. I'm having. Like I was hoping I'm having a nightmare and I can, you know, like a dream, I can pinch myself mm -hmm. and I could wake up. And they were like, We got her, we got her. And they're calling me names and they're referring to me really nasty words. And I was like, wow, this is happening and this is, I'm like, what's going on? Why am I the spy? They were calling me a spy. Ended up uh, dragging, uh, we did drive very far. It's still in the central of um, Pristina at this abandoned building. And they end up dragging me from the van to, to this room, a huge building. And when we got near, my feet were dragged. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even walking. My toes were just like, I could feel the ground. I was just being dragged like a body. And they're still swearing and they're so happy they have got me away from the Americans. And they said, we found, I mean, they swearing, they, we found her and this and that, the spy, this and that. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I really started panicking. I knew I was in big trouble. And uh, the boss, said take the hoodie off so they took the hoodie off and I was on my knees and I looked at him he looks at me I said oh so he said you're the one and I'm thinking okay clearly I'm so famous now <laughs> I mean I'm the one <laughs> wow such a spy James Bond girl <laughs> you know when I look back I'm like gosh bad bad girl anyway so uh <laughs> um he actually gave the the, the order for me to be, what can I say in this podcast? Can I use words? Everything you want. Yeah. So he said, okay, I want to watch this. You guys rape her. And when he said that, I was like, oh my God. And I, you know, you can't even describe it with words. The, the millions of conversations in my head with myself, like this can't be happening. This is not happening. And I started screaming because I was flipped on my back. I'm pinned down by other guys and all my, everything I had on was ripped so fast. And the only thing I could do is just as I was pointing my, my face to the ceiling and I'm just like, please don't do this. I'm a virgin because I didn't know what else to say. I was so scared. I mean, the way I was, I grew up is that in a small town, in order to marry a, a nice, decent guy, you had to be a virgin when you marry or when you decide to be somebody's. Otherwise, the whole town will know they will, they will let you go. 
you can't stay in a family if you haven't come as a virgin. Things have changed now. It's tremendously, I'm so surprised. When I go back home, it's like, like anywhere else in the world. But not so long ago, it wasn't the same. This is only 20-something, 23 years ago, 24 years ago maybe. We're talking really like extreme in terms of you had to be a virgin, that kind of stuff. When they heard, when the boss heard this, because the guys were so charged up, like, yeah, we're going to do this. And the boss luckily heard when I, when I said that so out loud that I was a virgin. And he's like, whoa, boy, stop. And they all stopped. It's like they programmed to stop. And they're all like undressing. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm like, oh, my God. It's just like, what's happening? He's like, put something on her. He said, boys, we have stumbled across a huge cargo. In my humble opinion, cargo is something that you ship and you it's good. And I thought, what cargo? I'm a human. Like, I'm thinking in my head. I, mean, I was always like a thinker. He said, right, let's get her ready to the safe house because uh, she needs a lot of training. And I, I didn't understand what he was meaning with a lot of training. So took me to the house and introduced me. There, had, there was a lady there, this woman, uh, much older than me. And uh, she was very sinister, and uh, they all were sinister, to be honest. Very, very, very rough people. And uh, they trained me. They, I mean, in the book, it's a lot of details. I don't want to even go into the details now. It's quite upsetting, but I was, um, just on the hindsight, I was made to watch a lot of the acts and to the point where, you know, it's like people might watch porn and they might enjoy it, but when you are forced as a child to watch something like that and a gun being held to your head that you have to watch, you can't even blink. No matter what's happening, how cruel the sexual act is and whether the person that's being done to is conscious or not, you're still having to watch. And it's um, if you see an animal like that, it's upsetting. When you see a human, it's lifeless and uh, being abused like that, it's, it's, uh, it's hard. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. Like that's, you, you wouldn't wish that upon anyone, but how many people were in this place? Do you know? It was, I never, I only saw the other girls when they came to be done something to. Who was I, doing something to them? Was it the, the soldiers gang. or was it? The gangs, uh, the ga the human trafficking gang. I was taken by human trafficking gang and organ harvesting gang. So I was with them now. They were no soldiers. They were just complete monsters. And no matter what they claimed they were in the past or who they served, I can tell you they might have served for the sake of anger or vicious stuff and they might have killed some Serbs in the act of war. But what they continue to do to their own people, because I, I was from outside, but they continue to do this to their own people. The Kosovan children that went missing, the Kosovo girls that went missing during the war, some of which organs have been found to exist in someone else's body in Germany and so on. I've been following such a track of people asking questions, where did my heart come from? When they start doing the research and the DNA, they go back to Kosovo. But my son has gone missing since war. We thought he was dead. No, your son clearly was trafficked and his heart taken by the black market and ended up saving a boy in Germany, that kind of stuff. So how could you do this to your nation? And so when I say this, I don't hate the Kosovo. I absolutely love the people are so lovely. And I have lots of Kosovo friends and I have so many Serbian friends. But I'm saying that the gangs, uh, the, the human trafficking, regardless of what nationality or religion they are from, they are monsters. If they are even able to think of trafficking anyone or doing anything to anyone that's living being, for me, they are monsters. I don't care what religion they are. To me, they have zero religion. Or For me, they're just like, uh, how can I say, no identity. They're just monsters. Yeah, evil. That's evil, evil complete evil. Doing the most catastrophic things for money yeah that's what it all boils down that's to it. money they completely brainwashed they all they care it's money they're suffering and the pain i don't believe in wars i don't believe there should be wars but i understand people can be brainwashed i interviewed a man earlier who says look at that time i was conditioned to just follow orders 
Yeah. Just do what I want. I thought that was normal. Some people came out of the army and they think, what was I doing? You talk about the weapons of mass destruction that didn't even exist. There was over a million people who were killed. Who are they fighting for? It's for the greed of the hierarchies who are calling the shots to make yep. them richer, but yet those suffer. Homeless people on the streets, the majority of homeless are military. They go away and fight for a country that when they come home, no one fights for them. And this is a sad reality of it. I don't believe in wars. I feel as if all wars are murder. Some people might get upset with that, but that's just the way I see the world. There was a time I actually tried to join the Marines, but I'm glad I didn't get into it because I would have been so... I'll do whatever it takes. This is the right thing to do. That's what I believe was, was just when I interview so many people, you realize the destruction, the pain, the misery it causes and innocent kids and women and men, men come back with PTSD because it's not a humane thing. A human beings shouldn't be seen. Destruction, pain, torture, misery. The PTSD now is a big thing where people are struggling mentally. Why? Because it's not a thing you should be seeing. Human beings should be, the cheese that is the most important thing on this planet is love. Yeah. But it's difficult because sometimes we don't love ourselves, sometimes we hate others and the whole vengeance and anger. And that's just the environment we're in. It's so fast paced. We don't really sit back and meditate and go, well, wait a minute, life is pure, life is beautiful and we're all confused, yeah. including myself. Listen, I have the answers to how I should be feeling. I don't always follow it because I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to create a business. I'm trying to earn money. Even though I know money's bullshit, it's an energy currency, it's an illusion. It doesn't really mean anything. But we give it so much meaning here. We feel as if that's what we need instead of communication, helping others. Because the gift in life is helping others. As soon as you help someone, you automatically feel good. It's a one-one yeah. for both parties. How long were you in captivity for? I was with them for quite some weeks. Uh, and I really had to, in the book, it's everything is precise. Because I contacted my two American police officers and got the timeline right because what you find is I also suffer with PTSD. I, I suffer so much after that. I was on a suicidal watch initially in the UK because I was, what happened next after my kidnap it just gets worse and worse. And you just think when you just like this can't go any worse than this, then you end up even worse. So when I eventually made it here, the PTSD was huge. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I went blank. I almost tried to delete you know, it took me quite a while to retrieve all my memories because I was trying to block it so much because I really, it's, it's a, I, I did this um, live thing the other night on Instagram only because I wanted to be really vulnerable with people, for people, for my audience that asked me, you are so strong. I'm not always strong. I'm, I'm only strong because I'm trying to do the right thing. It, that's giving me strength. But when I go to bed every night, I have, I go through the same journey that I've been through in real life every night. Every night I face these people. So it never goes away. I can completely understand the soldiers. I have lots of soldiers that I know. And they... They've done their best. And I know sometimes maybe they've done, you know, when the, because I've spoken to them, I've been working with them. It was out of their control because sometimes you get, get like you get the orders and people making the orders are not there. They're not seeing everything. It's only through statistics or information. So it's really hard sometimes to make these decisions. Even Peter and Brian, I mean, after what happened to me, Peter, especially Brian, Peter came to the UK and saw me. We reunited, but Brian completely hibernated. He was really hurt. And I always asked, wanted to know, you know, how did he feel? You know, how, what was going through his mind after he knew that I was gone? They thought I was just gone. I left them. I ran away. But when I initially escaped my kidnapping, my first kidnapping, first I say because there is the second coming um, I ha had an interview at the police station in Kosovo and uh, they wanted to know what had happened because the, the moment I got rescued or ran away I was fighting with the last guard that was left to kill me rape me and kill me it's a long story and people can you know read the book it's, it's really detailed so 
That night that I fought against the dri uh, the the driver, the uh, oh. guard. Uh, as I as I went down, I mean I I tricked him and so on. But as I walked down the stairs, it was from the fourth floor. When I come out, it was after midnight, and he punched me so hard. He had a gun on him, and he punched me so hard. I went flying onto the road, and as I flew onto this middle of the road in Kosovo, in Pristina. I looked around because I was all disorientated and I could see a big Jeep, sim same as the police American officer's Jeep that they gave me shelter, Peter and Brian. And I thought, oh, this is a police officer Jeep. So I started screaming and it was dark, only the street lights a little bit. And um, the police officer that was finishing his duty was an Italian police officer. And the reason I remember is because I saw his flag. So he saw me. So he started shooting at my guy that is about to shoot me. And he then started shooting at the police officer. So there was a lot of shooting going on while I was crawling on the road towards the police officer to hide behind the car. And uh, go to the police station. We do the interview. And they really are grateful that I finally... And they said, do you believe that you are the only survivor? We've been, we've been waiting for someone like you to come along and you have to appear in court. I said, there is no way I want anything to do with this. I said, here's the interview. I had a case number. I said, I want to go. I wanted to come back to Serbia and, and die at war with my mom and dad. I didn't want to be near these people. So uh, they took me back to Brian and Peter. I told them that they were giving me shelter. They woke up, they woke them up at 3 a.m. in the morning by then. Peter took me in. Brian woke up completely depressed. And they learned what had happened to me. The next day they said, Loretta, you have to go because now it's really dangerous. We have to change apartment. But you also need, you need to make a move, <coughs> excuse me, to Serbia because now you are a complete target. Like they were probably, con would have followed me everywhere until they killed me. And that was going to put their mission at risk themselves and every, every, everyone involved. So it was the right choice to have made. Went back to Serbia. They put me on this bus that took me as near to the border as possible. Crossed the border again. I knew where to start to cross the border. Still illegally because the, the borders were still shut. And when I reached my town, it was like a ghost town. They'd been bombing, they'd been like you could see the smoke and the, the, the air wasn't clear. And it was like a ghost town, literally like, oh, it's like, um, I don't know how to explain. And I got these shivers on me and I thought, oh, this, this is not safe and probably they're all dead, but I'm just going to go and see. By that point, what had happened is our town had gone to war <laughs> against the soldiers. So where the border with the town is, they had um, created these barricades, so they were shooting each other. But where I entered, there was nobody. But it was mostly on the on the main kind of road, where the big trucks had come in and the tanks. I went into my mom's dad's garden, and I can't find them anywhere in the house. And I thought, they died. They must have died in the crease of the mountains. I'm thinking these thoughts. Was there never any, any word contacted with your mom and dad when you were with the Americans? No, it's no way. Cause every, so you're all still the lines, living every day, not knowing yeah, what's not happening knowing. back home? No news, not knowing, no contacts, uh, no telephone, nothing. It no was letters, all, all nothing. dead. It was like... A non-existent kind of place. Mm -hmm. It's quite uh, daunting not to yeah. know. Because I wondered all the time if they're still alive. Yeah, because that's added pressure without all the other shit added yeah. on to what you were going through. To be honest, when I got taken the first time by the human trafficking and I knew, because they told me, like, uh, we have sold you to the highest bidder. This is before, before I escaped. And they said, once the highest bid is done with you, then we'll put you to the general public for prostitution. And after they are done with you as well, then we take your organs and we sell it to the red, uh, the black market. So ultimately, they said, you need to resign to the fact that you're going to die. So you're never going to escape us. And the first thing that went through my mind was like, I just need to make it through make it out, tell my mom and dad what's happened, and even if I have to die, it's fine. So the death itself didn't scare me, but my parents not knowing what had happened to me really frightened me. Their obligation, 
that that I thought they if they live throughout their life and I just gone I'm gone they're never going to know what happened to me and that was something that really drove me to make you through to fight to want to escape to stay alive to to stay alive to make a scene every time we stopped somewhere I made a scene that's how I escaped them I constantly was making scenes were they telling you that they were going to sell you on how much were people actually getting sold for did you know I don't know but uh, they had put because I was a virgin so a highest bidder had bought me so they had sold me to the highest bidder I don't know how much it's fucking creepy, isn't it? That is creepy. There, there is even a market from a hell. You'd think from a healthy human mind, okay, these guys are monsters, but the buyers are too. Yeah, and those are the ones are sitting in suits, probably sitting in fucking parliament and all over the world. I'm not saying I'm not. I don't have the answers and names, but it's the high end people who are walking the streets in suits and calling the shots and. I'd imagine so to be paying that sort of money. I don't know what they, what they pay, but with some of the stuff that you read, some of the girls are a hundred thousand, could be half a million. It depends who they are and what the use they can get from them. Do you think a lot of people actually buy these girls and just keep them in a house or a dungeon and nobody ever knows? All around I mean, the world. We ha over the years we have heard different heard different cases. Some people believe that have I mean this is information coming from a CIA agent. I haven't done my homework myself. Yeah, same. But it's just coming from someone else, different sources. So the few that have made have escaped and they never want to speak, they just hibernate, have said the, that some of the people have been killed, their blood has been taken, organs have been taken. Some say it's constant uh, prostitution. So it's really, it's like uh, their imagination is quite wild. It's just how much money they can make. But again, yeah. it's for their own evil thralls. We talk about adrenochrome and a lot of people think it's a conspiracy, this and that. But people are getting tortured for their blood and they're paying top dollar for it. And we talk about the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the brain. People And people just, a lot of these, some of these people will be using their money just to torture people for their own thralls, for their own kicks. There's, I've spoke to people who says that they've, the high end people with a lot of money are buying human beings, setting them into the wild and chasing them to kill them. Like some sort of game. It's people putting people's life in their It's hands. like Hunger Game, you know, yeah. like they're creating these films and then lo and behold, it's almost like they're giving people idea what to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's always been there. I don't know if they're just rubbing it in people's face as well, some of these films. It's not as if it's giving people ideas. I just feel as if it's already there. Yeah. And they create these films to say, this is what we do. We're going to make a film of it so you think it's so far-fetched. Yeah, exactly. As if, because sometimes you think, what do they? What were they smoking to have made this film? I mean, who came <laughs> up with stuff like this? I mean, I don't do drugs. I've never done drugs, but I'm just, you know, it's a, just an expression. Like, what are these people taking to have such creepy yeah. imagination? But maybe it's coming from real life uh, events. Yeah, events. So, seeing your mind, were you constantly thinking, I need to escape? Were you, were you, casing the place and thinking, okay, there's exits here, there's a security guards there. Did you plan it with any other girls or could you speak with anybody else? No, I was always on my own with them. So, as I said, they would bring girls only to teach me. And then once they were sort of convinced that I knew what to do because they didn't want me to be spoiled. I was just this pristine. They wanted me to know stuff. But if I was to perform something, it was to be done to the highest bidder. So, so he can see that I'm nervous maybe he or she, whoever bought me, because I probably would have been very nervous to have done whatever I learned. But so they, they have worked it out in such a way. So they trained me, never put me to test because they didn't want to spoil my innocence. And they knew that I was ready because like weeks of training and watching constant crazy stuff. And then, you know, but that night, uh, that night, I mean, it's a, it's a very long process because they were meant to... In the book, if people read it, because I'm just spoiling the whole book. No, but people, the, the powerful the story, people will go and buy the book. So they will, people will support you for your strength and what you've been through. So, Thank you. So they will, people go, fuck me, I like her. Or, She's unbelievable. So people will buy into, not the book, obviously we're here to promote the book, but people with your story, people go, I'm going to buy that. So people will just buy it for support and obviously find out in more detail. But genuinely, people people who come on the podcast people gravitate towards a book because they like the individual mm. 
it's more important. So I think just being you and showing you your strength and courage, I'm not going to die. And you thinking about all the shit that you're seeing and going through, you're still thinking, I don't want my mum and dad to suffer because it's a life sentence for them. It, 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 this is it. And it's so strong. It made me realise my love, my bond. Going back to the question you asked earlier, you said, uh, how was it like, you know, to be... Because I grew up, I was so lucky to grow, grow up with with two parents that really loved and respect each other. There was never strictness. It was very holistic way. Never pushed me to do anything. Always did their best to educate me. And they always said, if you're going to do anything, do it in front of us so we can help you. And my dad is a doctor. Because drugs were big, even on those days. But I was never into drugs. I was never into smoking or drinking anyway. So it wasn't something that I wanted to do. But yeah, my love for them, the way they... I just, the love they showed me just rubbed on me. And I just, it, it really rubs on you. It's like if somebody shows you love, then you, that really is so oh, contagious. Then you just feel that sense of thing back. And I just wanted to make it through so I could tell my mom and dad, look, this is what's happened. And I made it through. And you're okay. And even if we die, we die together. At least we all die in kind of thing. But uh, as I said, I, I made it back. I found my parents hiding in the basement. <laughs> Poor them. And, and they, in panic, they started like, my mom specifically, she's like, oh my God, you shouldn't have come back. No, no, no. And I'm like, what, mom? I have so much to tell you, you know? I just wanted to tell them like, mom, I've been kidnapped. And the love for you and, and the resilience. And I, I almost was so proud of myself that I made it through these people. She's screaming, oh my God. God, she's like blue murder. Oh my God, honey, you, you shouldn't have come back. You don't understand the danger you are in. And I'm like, what danger? You should have seen what danger I was in then. Yeah. You know, I was so young and naive that I thought that was the only danger that was lying. Because, you know, when there is a lion, there is hyenas and there is, you know, you get every kind of wild thing in the mix. But um, she was right. She was right, but I sort of under underestimated her panic and underestimated my outcome. I said, um, don't worry, mom, because she heard this van come into the garden, this truck, small, smallish kind of truck, soldiers, Serbian soldiers, they came in. And now to just identify in the book, this is mentioned, but for the people listening, in Serbia, we had normal army, which wore boots, as any army would. And then during the war, to make the numbers, what uh, Milosevic did, he recruited all the killers, murderers, rapists, any crazy people from the prisons that were with life sentence, out of prisons, put them on uniform, and put uh, trainers on them. So they knew... Who was so the soldiers can tell the difference? It was for them, not for us. Mm -hmm. But we learned it very quickly that that doesn't look right. These soldiers have got trainers and these soldiers have got boots. Why? So we learned it very quickly. And then the word spread very quickly. And this is way before I even made it to Kosovo. We already knew it was established. The prisoners, recruits from prisons, into soldiers were with trainers on, mm -hmm. with uniform, and the other ones with just normal uniform. So these soldiers. <laughs> Pick me up from my mom and dad. And to be honest, at that point, I wasn't scared. I wasn't, I'm like, mom and dad, don't worry. You know, I was so chilled about it. I said, I'm going to just tell them what had happened in Kosovo, that I was called a spy and that I got, you know, like taken, blah, blah, blah. And my mom is looking at me like, what? Because she never heard the story. And she's still screaming in the middle of the garden. My dad is holding her. They're both crying. And I just said, don't worry, I will speak to these guys. They will understand. They are our people. They are soldiers, Serbian. I'm, I don't know what I was thinking. And um, they took me. They didn't drive also very far. They were into the mountains very near to where we live. An abandoned building, quite run down, took me in. And uh, into this small room, interrogated me. I mean, when I say interrogated me, my God, first with words, what were you doing in Kosovo? Why did you cross borders? Who are you working for? I'm like, I'm not working for anyone. You guys almost killed us. So uh, my dad asked me to go. 
I go there. I stayed with some Americans. Then I got called a spy. So I got kidnapped by human traffic. So I'm telling the truth. No, you're lying. Okay, let's turn up the heat. So they start beating me up. And now that I start telling people this, people can see it. I had a dislocated jaw, which in fact is still it's quite sore from the beating that I got that particular day. And my nose got broken quite badly. Then it had to be reconstructed in, in the UK because I couldn't breathe. It was so badly broken. I looked like a rugby guy. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, so tough. <clears throat> You got to find humor because it's the yeah. story is quite um, Laughter, quite deep. It numbs the pain. Yeah, and um, they they really interrogated me badly. It was so painful, the beating, the pushing around, psychological stuff. And the last thing they did that I remember before I fainted, after I lost teeth and my teeth were just, I, I, I was a mess, unrecognizable within few hours I was swollen I couldn't see I was just a mess um, they kept pulling me and throwing me and back pain so I still have back pain I have two slip discs as a result of that and the last thing I remember from that interrogation before the next time I opened my eyes that I could open my eyes was they said she's not telling the truth all this beating let's brand her so they took this metal branding thing that they use for kettles and stuff. It was like a hashtag shape because I had it on my calf for a long time. I had to raise it, remove it. And they ha hashtag me. They, they burned my calf and the, the, the pain, the, the instant pain when it hits you, <clears throat> I just fainted. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just fainted. I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I, I don't remember what happened. I just blacked out. It was too much for the brain to handle the pain. Yeah, that sounds... And yeah, that's it really, uh, James. And then what happened was that that was, I thought it was going to be a very easy journey. I was going to literally be held for a bit, abuse some more, you know, maybe interrogated a bit more. And then I thought they can see that I'm telling the truth and they would release me. But no, I was completely wrong. I didn't realize that that was going to be six months of uh, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Just the 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 hardest thing for me initially was to to wake up in the small room, no window, damp, cold, smelly with a blanket, not being able to see, burning calf, missing teeth, bleeding. My ear was ripped. This ear is still, it's been reconstructed, but just waking up like I had fallen from, from the airplane, not even a building, and thinking that I was going to go home. And then you start thinking, okay, maybe today, and then you lose track of the days and the time because it's dark. You don't know what's happening. You don't know when it's night, when it's day, how many hours. How, you can't. You just can't. You have, have zero sense. So I really felt buried alive in this room for six months. The only time I left the room was when uh, initially that was my bathroom as well. And I would use it for everything that I had in me. And then I started starving myself because I, I couldn't handle, I thought I couldn't handle the the torture it was I just wanted to end it because my parents saw me who took me this time, so I thought enough. It's it's no need for me to fight anymore. No need to to continue. There is no need for any of this. So I'll give in. And I thought by starving myself by giving in that the darkness would take me. But it wasn't my time. It just was not my time. And um, yeah, then the torture really began. The rape, uh, the rape uh, from the soldiers was quite brutal. Uh, it was just, um, it was a, a matter of me making a decision in my head. And this is something that I, now people are so much more aware of it. And I'm so, so happy for them. They are aware of how powerful our mind is and how you can block and how you can think different things to rewire your 
your yeah. yeah your brain and yourself and what you're feeling even if somebody's causing you harm or somebody is lashing at you or whatever you can rewire yourself to almost block it so i learned in that small room because i didn't know what else to do i started meditating not that i knew what meditation was but just started thinking of my mom's food closing my eyes because i couldn't see anyway so i might as well have my eyes closed and just <laughs> thinking because oh, it was dark <laughs> So I'm like, laughing oh. because it's fucking mad and it's funny to see you smiling. And that's the beautiful thing because life is, what is that? What is that all about? How can you go through so much torture and torment but still be here smiling? Because I know people who's not even close to what you've been through and they're miserable bastards.